One of the great privileges of working at History Hit and making films together with our team at Timeline is the access we get to extraordinary historical locations like this one, Stonehenge. I'm right in the middle of the stone circle now. It is an absolutely extraordinary place to visit. If you want to watch the documentary like the one we're producing here, go to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix for history. And if you use the code TIMELINE when you check out, you'll get a special introductory offer. See you there. The enormity of total war is expressed in terms of the destruction of life, land and property by the narratives of attack and defence, victory and defeat. But the effect of war, the impact on nations, borders, politics and population is another story. And that story, viewed from a 21st century, suggests that the most influential battlefield of the Second World War was not Europe or the Middle East, North Africa or the Pacific. It was the Oriental battlefield. It was China, where war raged for years longer than anywhere else. A war that caused suffering on a scale and often of a brutality that it is almost impossible to comprehend. Caused more casualties than anywhere else. And was the war that changed the world. Adolf Hitler wanted war. He wanted to resume and reverse the verdict of the war in which he had fought from 1914 to 1918. He wanted to gain by violence the empire that he thought was the right, the destiny of the German people. And he got the war he wanted when his invasion of Poland in September 1939 caused Britain and her empire and France and her empire to take up arms against him. But this was a European war. It did not at once affect the battle that had been raging for two years, the battle to save China from Japanese invasion. Two years after Japan launched her invasion of China, or perhaps it was eight years after Japan's takeover of Manchuria, or perhaps 99 years after the first Opium War, China's future, China's unity, China's independence remained uncertain. It would take two more years until 1941 before the wars of East and West were joined in a world war that changed everything. By the time Europe went to war, Japan had much of what she wanted from China. The cities, the manufactures, the ports, the fertile farmland. In less than five months, Japan had occupied territory three times the size of Japan itself. And her focus now was on holding what she had won. The Japanese rate of advance through the years of the war tells the story of aggressive intent. In 177 days in 1937, Japanese forces advanced 3,085 kilometers, a rate of 17 and a half kilometers each day. The total fell to just over 2,700 in 1938 and just 400 in 1939. By 1940, it was 215 kilometers, a rate of little more than half a kilometer each day. Two main centers of Chinese resistance developed in areas to which they were pushed by the Japanese assault. The nationalist government, led by Chiang Kai-shek, established itself in Chongqing. The Chinese Communist Party, equally remote from the heavily populated areas of China, was in Shanxi Province in Yan'an. Of the northern Shanxi Province, the poet wrote, North Country Scene, a hundred leagues locked in ice, 
a thousand leagues of whirling snow, both sides of the Great Wall, one single white immensity. Into this immensity, the poet came. And in his poem, he dismissed the great man of history. All are past and gone, he wrote. For truly great men, he said, look to this age alone. The lines are from Snow, the best known of Mao Zedong's poems, the words of a man of destiny who knew himself to be a man of destiny. But how, in such an unpromising white immensity, is a person to realize his destiny, realize that this age alone is a time for great men? By what strategy? Frank Dorn, the American assistant military attaché in China, wrote that the Chinese look upon the scene of a campaign as a gigantic military chessboard. He was wrong. The board game that most resembles the strategy, of the Chinese Communist Party at least, is the 3,000-year-old game of Go, one of four essential arts. The others are calligraphy, painting, and playing a stringed instrument. There are many differences between Go and chess, but the most important is that in Go, once a piece has been placed on the board, it cannot be moved. Unless captured, it is a game of territory. You place a stone, you claim your territory, and you stay there. The strategy of Mao and the party was to establish bases some in areas away from Japanese occupation and others behind enemy lines in the occupied territory. The army must become one with the people, Mao wrote, so that they see it as their own army. Such an army will be invincible, and an imperialist power like Japan will be no match for it. For such a strategy to work, the cooperation of ordinary people, village people, peasants, was vital. The peasants were, the saying went, the water in which the guerrillas swim. The Japanese could have worked to gain broad support of the people, and so, in its powerful surge into the Soviet Union, could the Germans. Neither did, neither could. Their essentially racist attitude to the people they conquered did not allow it. But it was fundamental to the point and purpose of the communist cadre as they spread through the countryside. Marx had prophesied that revolution would start with the urban proletariat. Lenin was a believer, and in Russia, not Germany, as Marx had predicted, the revolution had come from there. But China had no significant urban proletariat, and the son of a peasant from Hunan knew that. Mao saw that the revolution in China would start with the peasants. At the party conference just before the Japanese surrender, he would say that Chinese Democrats will achieve nothing unless they rely on the support of the 360 million peasants. The base areas established by the guerrillas, the 8th Root Army and the new 4th Army would become the foundation of Communist Party strength, places where ordinary Chinese people voted for the first time, where the cadre lectured, exhibited films, put on plays, shared food and toil, and implemented a strategy fundamental to the game of Go. First, stake out territory, then develop positions. The nationalist Kuomintang, from its new capital in Chongqing, confronted the enemy with the large, though poorly equipped and trained, national army. The GMT lacked the cohesion of the communists, being an uncomfortable alliance of nationalist factions and regional warlords. Above all, the leader of the government, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, was the face of Chinese resistance to those foreign powers from whom he hoped he might receive assistance. 
and he had to show them that China was fighting, would fight, and was worth their fighting for. But of course, his hopes of receiving external assistance had, at the end of 1939, suffered a body blow. 1940 began in Europe with the phony war. War had been declared, troops had been moved, civilians evacuated. But nothing much happened until Hitler's generals were ready. And when they were ready, they unleashed their blitzkrieg. German armor, the panzer divisions, smashed through Belgium and northern France, and the Allied front collapsed. France, though the bulk of her armed forces remained in the field and intact, capitulated, leaving the United Kingdom as the only country opposing the Axis powers. Every other European country, unless neutral, was either allied with or occupied by Nazi Germany. The war had been going for less than a year. Germany's precipitate rush into war had cost China dearly. German military advisers had been recruited to train the Chinese army and German weapons were ordered that were to equip 30 new divisions to modern standards. It was all cancelled. Almost none of it happened. Once war swept across Europe, the country that mattered most to China was the Soviet Union. In 1939, in the most spectacularly illogical alliance ever forged between two ideologies, Germany and the Soviet Union had entered into a non-aggression pact, a pact of quite stupefying cynicism. Its secret provisions were an agreement that each would invade Poland and divide it between themselves, which they did. Hitler flies to survey what he has done, the destruction of a nation. Poland divided between the Nazi Germans and the Soviets. He has an air view of the devastation that he decreed. The conquerors of Poland knew that one day they would fight each other. And China now enters into the equation. For Hitler, the threat to the Soviet Union in Asia meant denying the Soviet Union in Europe his battlefield the many divisions of troops and squadrons of aircraft that were in Siberia. For Stalin, being able to remove the threat to the Sino-Soviet border would mean releasing that massive military reserve for action in Europe. And the Sino-Soviet border meant confronting not the Chinese army, which was poorly trained, poorly equipped, and no real threat, it meant facing the Japanese on the Manchurian border. And that, in 1939, the Red Army did, and did successfully in the Battle of Nomonhan. Because Shukov's tanks had smashed the Japanese, Stalin was content to support China in her struggle. Soviet pilots, as we have learned, flew missions in valuable support of the Chinese Air Force and Soviet weapons were supplied in limited numbers. Through the control of the Comintern, the Soviet government also exerted a continuing influence on Chinese politics, keeping the Communist Party inside the United Front. When Germany, to the complete surprise of no one except Stalin, attacked the Soviet Union in 1941, the situation changed. Stalin signed a non-aggression pact with Japan, enabling him to transfer the Siberian reserve to his Western Front. And thereafter, he took great care not to offend the Japanese until at least the end of the war in Europe, which was far in the future. We need to go back to September 1939, when Germany's invasion of Poland changed everything. In China, too, there was large-scale fighting in September. 
the first of the four battles for the city of Changsha, and it was not unrelated to events elsewhere. Japanese morale had been dented by defeat at Nomenhan and confidence shaken by the accommodation reached by her ally, Germany, with her potential enemy, the Soviet Union. Japan wanted to go onto the front foot. It wanted to strangle the Chinese will to resist. The Battle of Changsha pitched almost a quarter of a million Chinese against more than 100,000 Japanese troops, each side sustaining about 40,000 casualties. And after almost three fierce weeks, despite their naval and aerial superiority, the Japanese were obliged to withdraw. Changsha became the first major Chinese city not to fall into Japanese hands. The battle that carries its name deserves to be better known. It was followed barely a month later by the Battle of South Guangxi, a smaller action with less than 25,000 Chinese casualties and under 10,000 Japanese but an action of some significance, because it cut Chiang Kai-shek's capital, Chongqing, off from the sea. In September, the Japanese advance into Vietnam had cut China off from supplies that reached it through what was then a French colony. Like all French colonies, after the fall of France, Vietnam came under collaborationist Vichy French control. The Vichy regime offered little resistance to further Japanese incursions, providing the airfields that were to be vital in Japan's conquest of Malaya and Singapore. It was this further aggression that drove President Roosevelt, at the beginning of August 1941, to introduce the embargo on oil and other exports to Japan, which threatened to quickly deprive Japan of its ability to continue the war. Great and decisive actions against the Japanese will be taken to drive the invader from the soil of China. It was this threat that brought forward the invasion south into Asia and the Pacific. Before that happened, early in 1940 and following the closure of the Vietnam route, only the Burma Road, linking China to the north of India through the British possession of Burma, remained open. The new British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, anxious to appease the Japanese and avoid the prospect of having to fight them in the east when Britain was alone in fighting Hitler in Europe, succumbed to Japanese pressure and closed the Burma Road. Japan was slowly sealing China off from resupply. By the spring of 1940, supplies could only be flown in over the hump, that is, from India across the Himalayas. These actions isolated China, and Japan followed them on March 29, 1940, with the installation of a new puppet regime in Nanjing, which it called the reorganized national government, headed by Wang Jingwei, one of those peculiarly tragic figures that history throws up from time to time, whose death in 1944 saved him from being tried as a traitor. After occupying Guangzhou and Wuhan, Japanese troops turned their attention to the so-called backstage battlefields, where Communist Party troops had been fighting what they called an anti-mopping-up campaign, killing large numbers of Japanese troops and troops that supported the puppet regime. In actions at Yansu Cliff and Huangtu Hill, more than 3,600 Japanese troops had been killed, including their commanding general, Norihide Abe. It was in this campaign that Norman Bethune, communist doctor from Canada, became infected when treating a wounded soldier of the 8th Route Army. Bethune died on the 12th of November in Hebei. His fame is celebrated in China to this day. The great escalation of the war in Europe in May and June of 1940, the Blitzkrieg, had intensified Japanese military, 
political and diplomatic pressure in China. To boost morale and try to loosen the grip that Japan had on northern China, a large-scale offensive was planned by 8th Route Army headquarters. The campaign spread through the entire northern region, covering all the major traffic lines and involving 105 regiments. It has become known as the 100 Regiments Campaign. According to 8th Route Army Headquarters, in action ending on December the 5th, 1940, there were 1,824 fights of all kinds. 20,645 Japanese were killed, and 8th Route Army losses were 17,000. The campaign stripped many party units of their effectiveness. By late August, it was reported that many units were unable to comply with the requirements that at least half of their troops have weapons. The shock of the offensive also impacted on the invader. It led to a stiffening of Japan's counter-guerrilla strategy and the introduction of the security strengthening movement, Sanko Saisaku, which came to be known as the Three Alls policy. Loot all, burn all, kill all. The war in Europe had, meanwhile, been stalemated. As the 100 regiments fought Japan, the Royal Air Force fought Germany in the skies over England. On September the 17th, 1940, unable to gain air superiority, Hitler cancelled Operation Sea Lion, his plan to invade Britain. On Christmas Day of 1940, Mao Zedong reflected the experience of the year in a directive titled On Policy. Our policy is guerrilla warfare, Mao wrote. Our policy is, on the one hand, to develop the United Front to the greatest possible extent and, on the other, he continued, to have well-selected cadre working underground, to accumulate strength and bide our time. Within a year, as it turned out, time was to prove itself no enemy of the Chinese cause. Within the year, Germany had attacked the Soviet Union and Japan had unleashed multiple offensives to create the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. And the world was at war. One set of figures that is not in dispute is the effect that Japan's entanglement in China being bogged down in a war that was supposed to be a six-month incident but would simply not resolve itself because of the persistence of the Chinese people had on Japan's resources, on the manpower and materiel with which Japan could prosecute the war she had extended into Asia and the Pacific. When Japan launched its extraordinary offensive in December 1941, sweeping into and sweeping up Malaya, Hong Kong, the Philippines, the Dutch East Indies, she deployed little over 170,000 troops. And in China, from which they could not be extracted, she maintained about 680,000 troops. Before expanding the war, Japan had already lost in the fighting in China, 180,000 killed and more than 300,000 wounded. Much of the Pacific War was, of course, a contest on the seas, and its result was the destruction of the Imperial Japanese Navy. But the outcome of land battles did matter, and how that outcome may have been affected if some or all of the 35 divisions deployed in China had been released by a Chinese collapse can be conjectured. China did not collapse. Japan's invasion was, as Chinese folkloric comment had it, like a snake eating an elephant. But at the beginning of 1941, there was renewed evidence of the fragility of the United Front with which China faced Japanese aggression. The new Fourth Army perhaps 9,000 strong, was attacked by 80,000 soldiers, brothers-in-arms of the same nationalist army, 
Fourth Army casualties numbered about 7,000. Guomintang forces suffered minimal damage. It is known as the South Anhui, or New Fourth Army Incident. The Fourth Army was instructed by Army High Command to withdraw beyond the Yangtze. When it had failed to comply by the deadline, it was smashed. It was, according to the nationalist government, the inevitable climax to a series of acts of treachery and encroachment. It was, according to the Chinese Communist Party, a betrayal, an assault by overwhelming odds, an attempt to restart the civil war. And the danger of that led the Allies to pressure Chiang Kai-shek to halt his actions, which were certainly close to doing the Japanese army's job for it. But the Japanese were unable to put aside their militarist and racist views. Barely two weeks after the South Anhui incident, they provided one of the best known proofs to the Chinese people that there was no alternative to resistance. In a village named Pan Jia Yu. Through 1941, Mopping up operations would try to eradicate guerrilla and sabotage activities in Japanese-controlled territory. The Three Alls policy, Imperial Order Number 575, would characterize the action. A buffer zone was to be created, and within it, anything that could harbor, assist, or succor communist forces. To the Japanese, every resistance fighter was automatically communist, was to be destroyed. Pan Jia Yu was a small village in Hebei province, which was suspected of collaborating with the guerrillas. Japanese troops hauled all villages into the residence of the Pan family and swept them with heavy machine guns, killing the entire population. The dead, more than 1,300 of them, are among the estimated 2.7 million Chinese killed by the Japanese scorched earth policy. Four months after Pan Jiayu, Mao Zedong, drawing his title from an unambiguous interpretation of the South Anhui incident, published Conclusions on the Repulse of the Second Anti-Communist Onslaught. He was not deflected from the idea of establishing base areas by the Japanese Three All strategy. He was not distracted from seeing it all as a game of gold. When the example of the anti-Japanese base areas is extended throughout the country, he wrote, then the whole of China will become a new democratic republic. As he wrote, the Japanese high command was finalizing a quite different and more dramatic form of extending its influence. And on December 7th, carrier-based aircraft attacked the American naval base at Pearl Harbor in an attempt to neutralize American naval power in the Pacific, power that would be a threat to the co-prosperity sphere. December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. To establish that sphere, Japanese forces attacked British possessions in Malaya and Hong Kong. They attacked the Philippines and the Dutch East Indies. China suddenly had allies, powerful allies. At the end of 1941, the United States of America, Britain and her empire and the Soviet Union were at war with Hitler's Germany. But only two of them were fighting Japan. Stalin relied on his pact with Japan as insurance that he could take troops from his eastern frontier and throw them into the defense of the Russian heartland into which, in the largest military operation the world had seen, Operation Barbarossa, Axis troops had surged on June 22nd, reaching almost to the gates of Moscow, before winter put an end to their campaigning. 
As late as November 1943 and the Cairo Conference, Stalin would be fastidious in not offending his Japanese ally. He refused to attend because Chiang Kai-shek attended, representing China. Churchill and Roosevelt had to travel to Tehran the month after Cairo to meet separately with Stalin. Doubtful if so many millions have ever placed such unstinted confidence in three world leaders before. We came here, the official declaration reads, with hope and determination. We leave here friends in fact, in spirit, and in purpose. At the beginning of 1942, China could feel for the first time in five years that she was not fighting alone. And she could look forward to receiving support, weapons, ammunition, trucks, aircraft, which she did, but not many, and not where she most needed them. Lend-Lease was the scheme by which America, in President Roosevelt's words, the arsenal of democracy, supplied war materiel to her allies. But China's share of the supplies hardly rose beyond 2%. Even when the war in Europe was over, it only reached 4%. And it was shared out by an American general, Joseph Stilwell. Under Stilwell's stewardship, communist forces never received so much as a single bullet. And almost all that went to Chiang Kai-shek's men went to supply those divisions sent to support the British in Burma where Stilwell had command of the Chinese divisions until his manner and his performance finally led to his recall. Stilwell famously and frequently argued with the other American commander in the theater, Air Force General Claire Cheneau. They argued because Stilwell clung doggedly and dogmatically to a long outmoded belief in the massed infantry assault as the only way to win a battle a concept most people had surrendered in the mincing machine of the First World War. Stilwell dismissed Cheneau's advocacy of air power, and he dismissed just about anything that Chiang Kai-shek said. He called Chiang peanut. But he had the look, and Americans love that, a craggy hero, gangling, straight-talking, full of home truths. He returned stateside as a hero. His views on China and on Chiang poisoned the USA's views unfairly and influenced them still. When the United States Army Observation Mission, the so-called Dixie Mission, went to investigate the communist base in Yan'an in 1944, it formed views which would similarly distort America's understanding of the Chinese situation. By 1944 and the Dixie Mission's visit, Red Yan'an had been through numerous experiments, tested numerous theories, and listened to volumes of party policy, particularly what would, at the Seventh Party Congress, be termed Mao Zedong thought. An important step along the road to realizing a particular model of government, a model that argues for the legitimacy of government intervention in every aspect of life had been taken in 1942 with the Yan'an Forum on Literature and Art. It is mainly because of the unorganized state of the Chinese masses that Japan dares to bully us, Mao Zedong said. But how do you organize the masses? How do you avoid the state that the Chinese fear most? Luan, chaos. Historian Roger Howard wrote that the Yunnan period was the first in which Mao could demonstrate the effectiveness of his ideas over a relatively large area and a relatively long time in conditions suitable for experiment. The American journalist Theodore White noted that Mao Zedong was set on the pinnacle of adoration. He was the man. According to Otto von Braun, the German Comintern advisor, Mao worked at night and liked to sleep till midday. He had energy, conviction, away with words, and a cigarette habitually between his fingers.
When he delivered one of his lengthy speeches, he made, one observer noted, no gesture whatsoever. At the beginning of February 1942, Mao launched the Cheng Feng movement throughout the whole party with the speech, rectify the style of party work and oppose stereotyped writing. The so-called rectification campaign continued until the Seventh Party Congress in April 1945. What was happening in Yan'an was being noticed around the world. From 1939, important visitors were met at the airstrip by a VIP vehicle. It was an ambulance, and painted on its side was the legend presented to the heroic defenders of China by the Chinese Hand Laundrymen's Association of New York. The ambulance was a particularly eloquent example of the significant material support that poured into China from the Chinese diaspora worldwide. In May 1942, in Yan'an's hothouse of experimentation, where self-sufficiency was preached and practiced, the Yan'an Forum took place. Reportedly, a concerned writer had asked Mao to clarify the role of intellectuals in the new China, and Mao acknowledged the challenge in his opening remarks. Comrades, he said, you have been invited to this forum to exchange ideas and examine the relationship between work in the literary and artistic fields and revolutionary work in general. The gathering he addressed comprised leading and emerging artists in all fields, and he told them, no revolutionary writer or artist can do any meaningful work unless he is closely linked with the masses. These masses were also able to vote in San San Chi, the three-thirds system, but allocated a third of positions to members of the party, a third to members of other groups, and a third to those who were unaffiliated. In some places, votes were cast by dropping beans in a container, hardly a secret ballot. But for those who had never voted in their lives, it was something. And there was land reform, there was education. There was a lot that was shaping a new society and Mao Zedong thought was its touchstone. The month after the Yan'an Forum in June of 42, in the great carrier action off Midway, the Japanese suffered losses from which they would never recover. But their final defeat would be hard won. Even if he had wished to, Chiang Kai-shek could not have indulged in the same experimentation as Mao. His base, Chongqing, was notoriously subjected to remorseless Japanese bombing from early in 1938, regularly from 39 until the second half of 1943, when aircraft were withdrawn only because they were needed elsewhere. Almost 300 raids targeted Chongqing, and from 1940, when the Japanese Zero fighter was introduced and shot the defenders out of the sky, they were conducted against threadbare anti-aircraft defense. There were no significant military targets. This was area bombing of the sort that would be conducted by both sides in the war in Europe. As in Europe, it did fearful damage and took an awful toll on human life. Most of the city was damaged or destroyed and there were more than 10,000 civilian casualties. But as in Europe, where the total tonnage of bombs dropped by far eclipsed the tally in the Chinese theater, and where casualties far outnumbered those who would be killed by atomic bombs, saturation bombing failed as a war-winning strategy. It did not bring a population to its knees or to the negotiating table. By 1943, Japan had built thousands of strong points and blockhouses in China, more than 800 kilometers of roads and 4,000 kilometers of ditches, but could simply not extricate herself from the China incident that she had manufactured. 
Within a few months of Pearl Harbor, the war had begun to turn against Japan. The great naval encounter at Midway, defeat on land at Guadalcanal and in New Guinea, defeat in the Marianas. The perimeter of the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere that had been flung out so recklessly and had so rapidly encompassed one-sixth of the world's surface was being squeezed back towards Japan's home islands. In Europe, too, the tide was turning. Following the Battle of El Alamein at the end of 1942, the Axis powers were being driven back across the deserts of North Africa. To more calamitous effect, the devastating loss at Stalingrad led to the capture of a complete German army. The complexion of the war was changing. Germany needed some sort of miracle. Japan needed to strengthen defense of the home islands and could do so only by reducing the battlefields on which she had to fight. This argument was one of the justifications for Operation Number no. 1, Ichigo Sakusen, which also sought to neutralize American air bases in China from which bombers attacked Japanese cities and open a supply corridor between northern China and Vietnam. Ichigo was the largest action launched by the Japanese anywhere during the war. Half a million troops rolled forward against nationalist forces. Chiang Kai-shek had warned his allies that such an offensive was imminent. In January 1944, he advised it may be expected that before long Japan will launch an all-out offensive against China. But he had been ignored. China's allies habitually ignored the advice and the requests they received, particularly if these conflicted with priorities of their own. And Chang's anxiety to reinforce his troops against a Japanese offensive conflicted with the British and American priority, which was Burma. I am 58 years old this year, Chang said. Of all the humiliations I have suffered in my life, this is the greatest. Japan had pressured Thailand, then the only independent country in Southeast Asia, into an alliance, and then marched through that country into Burma, a British possession. Japan's occupation of Burma threatened India, also under British control, and a rich source of manpower, natural resources, and manufactured goods. Chiang Kai-shek was asked by his allies to support the campaign to eject the Japanese from Burma and sent several of his best divisions across the border. They were mauled by the Japanese, as were the British troops drawn mainly from the Indian Army. It was these forces that Chiang wanted returned to China to face the threat of Ichigo. But they remained involved in Burma going over to the attack late in 1944 and finally driving the Japanese out of Burma and restoring the supply artery, the Burma Road, now known as the Lido Road. But the success of the Chinese formations in the Burma campaign was at terrible cost to China itself. With the best Chinese divisions locked away in the Burmese campaign, regular, poorly trained formations faced battle-hardened Japanese divisions with artillery, 800 tanks, and air support. China suffered as many as 600,000 military casualties and a further 200,000 civilian casualties during the Ichigo offensive that swept south, taking Hunan, Henan, and Guangxi and overrunning the airfield. In the event, the overland route to Vietnam was to prove worthless. It had been so bomb damaged that it could not be used. The loss of the airfields was similarly valueless. The Americans by now had the long-range B-29s in service, and the bombing campaign against Japan intensified. On April the 23rd, 1945, Chairman Mao Zedong opened the 7th National Congress of the Communist Party of China. Exactly one week later, Adolf Hitler was dead. Berlin fell to the Red Army. It fell in ruins. <laughs>
the entrance to Hitler's air raid shelter. It was just outside that the bodies of Hitler and Eva Braun are said to have been destroyed. At any rate, that's one story. We can all form our own opinion as to whether these are relics of the event or not. The war in Europe ended before the Congress did. And though no one knew when or how the war against Japan would end, the issue was not in doubt. That China would be on the winning side was not in doubt. On August the 6th, the United States dropped the first of two atomic bombs on Japanese cities. On the day the second bomb was dropped, the Soviet army invaded Manchuria and the 8th Root Army and the new 4th Army, led by the Communist Party, launched large-scale offensives. On August the 15th, Japan's Emperor Hirohito, in a radio broadcast, said, we have decided to effect a settlement of the present situation. Japan's representatives surrendered to the Allies aboard the USS Missouri, anchored in Tokyo Bay. On the 2nd of September, 1945, at a separate ceremony, China accepted the Japanese surrender. In the fight against Japanese aggression that had been consuming their country for 14 years, the Chinese people triumphed. The events of the war of resistance against Japanese aggression, the political forces that developed and the support they had cultivated, determined the direction that post-war China would take. On the 1st of October 1949, after four years of further struggle, the People's Republic was declared and a new China was founded. This is the new China, a great power a powerful economy, a nation so changed by war that it has, in its turn, changed our world. The war against Japan lasted for 14 years. From 1931 to 1941, China had fought alone. Chinese casualties exceeded 35 million including 3.8 million military losses. 1.5 million Japanese had been killed, wounded, or captured. China's total property loss was $100 billion. The loss to the economy, $500 billion. When the fight was over, there were 1.32 million troops in the People's Army and 2.68 million in the militia. When defeated, 1.28 million Japanese soldiers surrendered. On the 70th anniversary of Japan's defeat, Chinese President Xi Jinping spoke of the war. Justice always wins, he said. Peace always wins. The people always win.